Imperial Uncle. Chapter 26. I've always considered myself licentious but never fickle when it comes to love, to date, I've never made anything like a vow with anyone. Not to mention that the foreign queen of Nahe lives in a land beyond the horizon, and there's no way I had anything to do with her even before my sleeve was cut. I make my case earnestly, analyzing the situation point by point. Getting myself dragged into something like this is no joke I may end up being accused of conspiring with an enemy state. Kitch he listens as I explain myself. However, I have no idea if he believes me. Kilai interrupts to add helpfully, even if the emissary says so, the man they're talking about may not necessarily be our imperial uncle. It could be that the queen wants to drive a wedge into your majesty's relationship with him, or maybe someone with a hidden agenda impersonated him. I wonder if the emissary mentioned what this Prince Hawaii who made a vow with the queen looked like. With a slight smile and his hands clasped behind his back, Kitch he says, we haven't yet asked we wanted to see what Imperial Uncle has to say first. Prince Fu says, why don't have someone ask the emissary of Nahe if the queen has ever described what Prince Hawaii looked like to him? If she has, then won't we find out for sure as soon as we bring around Prince Hawaii along with some men about his age, and see if the emissary recognizes him. Both Prince Zong and Prince Lu agree that this is a good idea. Only Prince Jia objects. There are plenty of ways to sow discord. That barbarian woman is a queen, after all, she needn't pay for such a scheme with her own reputation this meeting between her and Prince Hawaii probably did happen. This emissary has never met the man who made a vow with the queen. Even if he's heard a description, it was likely only skin deep. I wonder how many years it has been since this vow. If it was many years ago, then as appearances tend to change, even if the queen came personally she'd likely require some time to figure out if he's the same man how can the emissary tell that it's him. This prince pretty easy to recognize. If she's seen me before, and described some of my distinctive features, he can probably recognize me. Let's try asking first whether it may be productive or not. Otherwise, if I do end up giving myself for the empire and become an alliance husband, only to arrive in Nahe for the queen to realize I'm not the right person, wouldn't that end up ruining both our lives? Kilai laughs. Look at Imperial Uncle Panic he's even talking about how he's going off to be an alliance husband now. If your majesty doesn't agree to trying his, his indignance is really going to reach the heavens. Kitch he stares at me, furrow between his brows. A moment passes before he speaks again. Fine. This concerns the diplomatic relations between two countries and it's not to be trifled with. Let's do as Kilai suggests and ask the Nahe emissary. The eunuch we sent to make inquiries returns about an hour later, and reports, the emissary of Nahe says that not only did their queen speak of Prince Hawaii's appearance, she even drew a portrait of him and hung it in her chambers. He's seen this portrait before, so if Prince Hawaii was to stand before him, he'd be able to recognize him. Everyone in the hall, including my emperor nephew, turned their eyes on me again. Prince Fu says, that barbarian woman is besotted. But I wonder whom she could be besotted for, I reply. Kitch he gives me another look, but says nothing more. And so, I have to go before this emissary and see if he can identify me. Having an emissary identify someone isn't the same as having a plaintiff pick out a criminal from a lineup in the halls of the Ministry of Justice. One must make it more tactful, more complicated, more in accord with our system of rights. Thus for the sake of this identification, many steps are prepared in advance. His Majesty gives the order, then the Ministry of Rights takes the lead in setting up a small banquet in the palace gardens to entertain the emissary. And then myself and a few other princes and heirs close to my age are made to attend this banquet in informal dress. I return to my estate and change into informal dress before going to the palace again. In one of the smaller halls I meet up with my nephews, and we head to the gardens together. The emissary of Nahe is about 50 years old, dark of skin, wears a turban, 
and the ends of his handlebar mustache end in upturned curls I wonder if he intentionally shaped it thus with glue and he looks overall rather exotic. He stares unblinkingly at us as we approach, and only turns to whisper in his strange language at a Han attendant after we take our seats. The Han attendant then turns to the highest seat of honor. Your Majesty, Lord Alunan said that none of these princes look familiar. That man isn't here. The moment I hear this I feel as though the clouds have parted to show a clear blue sky. On his throne, Kichi smiles. The one over there in purple would be my imperial uncle, Prince Hawaii. The Han attendant whispers this to the emissary at once, and the emissary suddenly turns his attention to me again. He spouts a string of words to his Han attendant. The attendant reports back, Your Highness, Lord Alunan says that there's no way that man is this Prince Hawaii. The Prince Hawaii the Queen has her heart set on is muscular, earnest, fleet of foot, and square of face. He is both a persevering and considerate man. Emissary Alunan dips his finger into a drink and draws a few lines on the table. He mumbles something again and the Han attendant relates, Lord Alunan is good at drawing. He can make another copy of the portrait the Queen drew, to let your majesty see who it is. Why didn't he say so earlier? He's had me tormented so, tricked us out of an imperial banquet too, and only now spits out such key information. I can't even be bothered getting angry anymore I just want to find out who on earth would be so charming as to seduce a queen in my name. Everyone else seems to feel fine about my being able to rid myself of suspicion, excepting Prince Chia, who looks obviously disappointed. But everyone also seems rather excited to find out just which prince why the queen has fallen for, and so Kichi immediately sends for writing implements. Foreigners do admire central plain culture when all said and done, so even though emissary Alunan can barely speak a word of our language, he's quite familiar with the ink and brush of our celestial empire. Rolling up a sleeve, he dips his brush in ink, and within the space of a quarter hour he's managed to produce the picture of a head. Two eunuchs move forward and hold up the picture. I stare at it, and find a head with a square face, thick brows, and a few short brush strokes of a mustache, looking quite the earnest fellow. He's likely an acquaintance of mine he looks familiar. We have probably never met this man before. His appearance does differ a lot from Jinjun. Prince Zone, Prince Chia, Prince Fu, and Prince Lwil so express their unfamiliarity to this face, and how much it differs from my face. Kilai is the only one frowning in concentration. This servant do get the feeling that he have seen this man somewhere before, he rubs at his temple, seems like, seems like, this servant may have glanced at him in passing once or twice, he seems to be, someone who works for Uncle Prince Hawaii's estate. By then, I've realized who it is, so rising from my seat, I concede, Your Majesty, the heir of Prince Xiao is correct. Judging from this portrait, he looks a lot like one of this servant's palanquin bearers, Han Si. In the end, this whole thing with the Queen of Nahe turns into a farce. Kitch he has someone go to my estate to bring Han Si before the throne. He's also very much confused, and can do nothing but tremble in the Hall of Golden Bells, tearily proclaiming his innocence. Finally, the facts are verified with the emissary of Nahe, we nail down the year where everything happened, and then we manage to largely clarify the whole story. About four years ago, when our two countries first entered into an armistice, the queen once sneaked into our capital in plain clothes alongside some traveling merchants. One day, I went to a certain brothel seeking entertainment, and Han Si and some of my other attendants were waiting outside the doors when they happened to run into the queen. It really is hard to imagine how uninhibited foreign women are the queen thought male courtesan brothels were intended for women, and so she thought to go inside and see it for herself. Fearing that she may make a scene and spoil my mood, my attendants moved to block her way. Among them, Han Si had a better temper than the others, and attempted to console her, advised the others not to make things awkward for a woman. Thus the queen privately set her heart on him. It was raining at the time, and as the queen didn't know her way around the capital, she lost her traveling companions and wandered on that street back and forth. 
Unable to bear watching her like that, Hansi bought an umbrella at a street vendor and walked her to the city gates where she was to meet up with her entourage. The queen said to Hansi, Today, I owe you a debt, and I will definitely come back for you. I'll never forsake you. Hansi thought this debt was one of gratitude, merely a promise to repay him in kind. That is because no woman in our celestial empire would ever say a thing like that to a man. But a vow it really was, and the queen did not go back on her word. She's come to ask us for her king consort. Tears streaming down his face, Hansi swears he told the queen his name was Hansi, and that he was a palanquin bearer. However, because my going to a brothel full of male courtesans wasn't exactly an illustrious undertaking, he didn't dare divulge whose palanquin bearer he was. The emissary says that the man who made a vow with the queen did state his name as Hansi, but the queen thought there was no way he was just an ordinary person. She marked down the pattern on my palanquin and found out that it belonged to the Prince Hawaii estate, and so determined Hansi has to be me. Hansi and the emissary of Nahair each kept in different rooms while this whole investigation is conducted, so collusion is impossible. And the story they produce lines up like warp and weft in a bolt of silk clearly, it is the truth. For a palanquin bearer like Hansi to chance upon such a wondrous fate is truly more brilliant a tale than anything out of an epic novel. Too bad it's also given me quite a fright. Once the whole business has been largely cleared up, Kijhi summons me to his study and finally gives me some comforting words. This whole thing with the Queen of Nahe is truly bizarre. Seems you've been dragged into it over nothing. Oh, it's quite all right. But at the time, the idea of it made the servant break into a cold sweat. This servant really was afraid your majesty would send the servant off to a foreign country as an alliance husband. Kijhi smiles. Didn't we tell you before that we will not let a new princess consort cross your threshold? Chinjun, why do you have so little faith in us? At once, I add, of course the servant would never but your majesty only said you wouldn't let a princess consort cross the servant's threshold, and you never said you wouldn't let the servant cross another's threshold. That's why the servant was still somewhat worried. Kijhi studies me closely, gives me another smile, and paces away from me, this isn't actually over yet. We don't know if the Queen of Nahe will still want him as a king consort after finding out the Prince Hawaii in her heart is really a palanquin bearer. Supposing she does, we must at least give Hansi some sort of title so this whole affair will be a bit more respectable. Imperial uncle, what an abundance of talent your estate holds one marvelous thing just happens after another. This was a predestined union bestowed upon Hansi by the heavens. What they call written in the stars. Actually, it has nothing to do with the servant. Kijhi stops pacing. In the end, you were still dragged into it. This must have caused you a great deal of stress, and the knife wound on your arm hasn't healed completely yet. You should go home and spend some time recuperating. I kneel and kowtow. Please excuse the servant, then. Your Majesty, you shouldn't work too hard, either. Kijhi's voice sounds out above my head. We are very glad to have you constantly concerned about us so, Imperial Uncle. I leave his study and stroll leisurely towards the Imperial City's gates. Crossing one bridge, I spot a streak of familiar ink blue coming towards me, and in spite of myself, my heart stirs again. I stop cupping my hands in greeting. Chancellor Lu, what a coincidence. He raises his sleeves, and bows to me, just the same as ever, just as courteous as ever. Your Highness. And I reply just as courteously, seeing as you're heading inside, it seems you still have work to do. The corner of his lips tilts upwards. Your Highness is heading outside. Looks like the important business you're here for is over and done with. I laugh aloud, once, twice. It's not as though I ever have any important business it's all just some trivial this and that. That smile is still there, resting by his lips. This official heard that your highness's estate produced a king consort. Was that banter? After we came out of the water pavilion that day, why would he ever banter with me again? 
he probably just wants to stay as far from me as possible. Was it sarcasm? But I know he's not someone who finds joy in mocking others. Well then, it must have been a most ordinary bit of pleasantry. To me, it's something that I can console myself with by treating it as banter. Yes, my estate has produced another special character. It does appear to be more full of talent by the day. Lu Tongyi stares at me with his bright clear eyes. Chancellor Lu, as you still have work to do, this prince won't keep you any longer. Please excuse me. He bows again and quietly says goodbye. I continue my walk to the city gate. It is nearing dusk, and the sun is setting, red clouds are again filling half the sky. End chapter. Imperial Uncle. Chapter 27. Hansi refuses to be an alliance husband. I thought this whole king consort business was over and done with. That's why returning from the palace, I spent a wistful moment thinking about my rancy, and then I took a little nap. I don't get up until after dark, and as soon as I take a seat in the minor sitting room, a dark shadow throws itself through the door to prostrate on the floor and starts crying in earnest. Your Highness, please, on account of this humble one's many long years of service, don't send this humble one to a foreign country. This humble one's parents are elderly and his siblings are still so young if this humble one go to a foreign land they'll have no livelihood. Your Highness, please show mercy. Hansi really is smart. Knowing how hard a nut my emperor nephew is to crack, he didn't dare shed a tear in the palace he's choosing to come back to cry in front of me instead. This has nothing to do with mercy or no mercy from this prince. This is a marriage foreordained by the heavens between you and the queen, bestowed by fate. In a few days his majesty will grant you a title, and the government will support your parents and siblings in your place. You don't have to worry about anything. A real man should sacrifice his individual self for the interests of the state and its citizens. You'll marry the Queen of Nahe and share her throne so many people can't even imagine this happening to them. Why would you ever refuse? Still Han Si keeps crying, in tears and snot and wailing fit, I've never seen a fellow as tall and strong as that cry himself into such a state. Han Si says he fears foreigners, he hears that they all eat meat raw, drink blood raw, and don't even add salt. He says his mother had always taught him that as a man of true character, he mustn't ever cross another's threshold, marry into a bride's family to live with them. So I have little choice but to explain things and try to talk him around. Sure, crossing another's threshold may be improper, but that all depends on what sort of threshold it is. Right now he's going to marry a queen, to go be king consort so the frontier will be stable. History will surely remember his contributions. Still Han Si refuses. He says one mustn't throw away one's family name. His formal name is Han Chuan Bao, and if he gives himself to the foreign queen he'll have to take the queen's family name and turn himself into a foreigner. He can't tolerate it. From what I heard, the queen of Nahe's last name is Hee Nalu. When Han Si marries in he'll probably be named Hee Nalu Chuan Bao or Chuan Bao Hee Nalu. I think that's a rather good name. Han Si has a backbone of steel and would rather die than submit, and half my head starts to throb and throb with pain over all the noise he's making. To begin with, I've never been good at talking sense into people, and when it comes to this I can only try to convince him with advice and not by threatening him. On top of that, the date of our rebellion draws nearer every day. If this whole thing is still a mess, am I going to commit this treason or not? Han Si continues to raise a ruckus until midnight, when with great difficulty I manage to convince him to go to bed. And poor me, who has to go to bed with only a half bowl of thin kanji in my stomach. The next day, I'm still in my bed sleeping late into the morning when Steward So comes in to announce that Chief Yun has arrived. It comes as no surprise to me that Yun you should visit today. I get out of bed. Steward so tells me, Chief Yun said he only came over on a whim to call on you, and once he heard that you weren't up yet, he said he's leaving, and tasked me to pass on this message. He said it's enough that your highness knows he's been by. 
Tell Chief Yun to wait a little, this prince will be over shortly. And while I dress and wash up, Steward So comes in again to tell me that Chief Yun is already gone. Yun Yu was never so impatient to leave just like that before, I judge that he must have something important to tell me, and found my estate an inappropriate place to do so. Once breakfast is being served, I send a messenger to the Yun estate with an invitation to drink at the Moonlight Pavilion. Soon after this invitation reaches the Yun estate, before I even had the chance to arrange for a messenger to make a reservation, an announcement comes that Chief Yun has come over. Well now I'm confused what's the point of all this going back and forth? Yun Yu comes into the hall and sits down, and starts saying this without waiting for me to ask, didn't your highness find the Moonlight Pavilion common? Why do you suddenly want to ask the servant to go there? Don't you like that place, Chief Yun? If this prince is going to invite you to dine, this prince must naturally cater to your preferences. Yun Yu laughs. It's so obvious that your highness is used to being entertained, and seldom does the entertaining. A spot at the Moonlight Pavilion must be reserved far in advance. If you try to make a reservation on such short notice, all the good courtyards will be gone, and they won't be able to prepare any presentable dishes either. This servant was worried that it would dampen your mood and so the servant simply came over again. No wonder. And here I was thinking you left in such a hurry because you thought my estate wasn't as nice as the Moonlight Pavilion that's why I sent an invitation with such haste. Yun Yu holds up his teacup and puts on a look of resignation. Good thing this servant have always been the calm type, and come here so often that the servant have no shame anymore. Otherwise, with all that can be read into what your highness just said, this servant really would have thought you were trying to turn this one out. I raise a hand. Don't. This prince would turn out any guest before turning you out, Chief Yun. This prince was trying to crawl out of bed as fast as I could while telling the servants to make you stay, but you probably still thought my tardiness a slight to have left so swiftly. And here this prince had to try to make amends by inviting you to the Moonlight Pavilion, and now even this prince's explanation is failing to win your understanding. Yun Yu heaves a sigh. This servant's trespasses should be punished by a thousand deaths, this servant had disturbed your sleep, and so out of reverence for your highness the servant cautiously excused myself the servant hadn't imagined how much trouble that it end up causing. I heave a sigh as well. Forget it. It's not as though it's the first time this prince ever said that when it comes to you, this one admit defeat. With his cup's lid, Yun Yu slowly pushes the floating tea leaves aside. This servant suppose. Is it over that self-same reason that your highness told his majesty that it would be potentially dangerous to send the servant to be an alliance husband, and that this official is not a suitable candidate? These words prick at my heart. Looks like what I said Yun Yu is Yun Tang's son, he's not suitable has already been passed along. When I said that, I was worried that Yun Yu would become the king consort candidate. Yun Yu can steal himself, and he can control himself. If presented with the opportunity, he will very likely accept without demur. If the fires of war are reignited at the frontier, and coordinating with the rebels within our borders will make the outcome certain. For now I'm still confident that I can control Yun Tang and Wang Qin. But if the kingdom of Nahe is thrown in, then Kijhi's throne may actually be in some danger. No matter what, I can't let Yun Yu become this king consort. I rub at my temples. Chief Yun, you're not blaming me for spoiling a good match for you, are you? Yun Yu still smiles. Your Highness ensured this official safety in front of His Majesty, I ought to be grateful. Fathers and this servant's reputation is what it is, people talk about it all the time. It's no harm done if you use it as an excuse. Yun Yu looks as calm as a cloudless sky with a soft breeze passing by. If I'm to judge by his expression alone, he really doesn't seem to be holding a grudge. As long as you don't hate this prince for meddling, Chief Yun. Though we didn't manage to go to the Moonlight Pavilion, this prince do have a quiet and secluded location in this one's estate, and this prince have never invited you there before. It's called the Water Pavilion. 
Why don't we go there today to drink our fill? I guide Yun Yu onto the floating gallery leading to the water pavilion. Thinking back to how carefully I'd led Rancy here the other day, I find it all a bit ridiculous. Standing in the gallery, Yun Yu turns to the wide open lake shore, and he gives the folded fan in his hands a little tap. What an elegant water pavilion you have here, your highness. So such a place exists in the rear gardens could this be the place where you would keep a lover? As I turn the stone crane to fold up the shoreside gallery, Yun Yu gasps with wonderment. Looks like this servant probably made the wrong guess earlier. The moment the floating gallery is retracted this place feels just like a water prison. This wasn't the place the previous Prince Hawaii locked your highness away so you could study, was it? Chief Yun, that's incredible. You've managed to hit it right on the head. Looks like you're being placed in the sense orate and not the Ministry of Justice was a true waste of talent. Yun Yu laughs softly. Compared to the Rancy standing here in the scene the other day, this moment, this setting, and this person seems vastly different. Even though the scenery is no different, with someone different, the mood is different, too. Yun Yu stands in the cool breeze, looking content as he gazes off at the center of the lake. Watching him, an idea I've always kept deep in my heart begins to stir. Yun Yu and I sit by the railing where it's brightest, on soft rattan chairs placed next to a small square table, with a jar of good wine and a few fine dishes served cold. Yun Yu's eyes narrow. This water pavilion of your highnesses is a nice place to cool off in the summer, but in the winter it may be a bit too cold. Father used to love making me come here to study in the dead of winter. The entire pavilion was like an ice house, even lighting a dozen braziers was no use. My teeth would be chattering the whole time, but still I had to endure the cold as I read books on the art of war. Fortunately, later he started treating me like a hopeless case, and thus my suffering came to an end. Yun Yu raises a cup and stares right at me. In the future, when your highness dons the dragon robe and rules over the realm, the former Prince Hawaii in the underworld will surely be happy. I can't help but laugh. Happy? This prince would be quite happy that he doesn't jump out of his coffin to cut this prince down with a saber. Father spent his entire life doing nothing but repay his majesty's kindness, to lay down his life for the state, but he was accused of harboring a treasonous heart instead this is what happens to so-called loyalists. I pour myself a cup of wine, and raise my cup the same as he, turning it over and over in my hand. It is precisely because of what happened to him that this prince get it now. What is loyalty? What is treachery? The world was never meant to belong to the same person always. Since this prince is going to bear this infamy anyway, why not have the deed to go with it? Won't those morally pure officials cursing this prince's name now all have to kneel and kowtow before this prince, shouting long live the emperor just like everyone else once this one is the one sitting on the throne? As for father, if he should find out from the underworld, then he can have a good look at how this lost cause rules the empire. These words of mine are said to the lake, against the wind. They sound like they've come out of a surge of hot-blooded passion, they sound vehement, aflame. The Yuns and the Wangs are all clever. I have no idea why Yun Yu was testing me just now, but giving him that speech should make him feel more at ease. It's rare for you to give vent to such lofty sentiments, your highness. I reply quietly, it may be because the day of our undertaking draws near and this prince is finding it harder to contain myself. Yun Yu smiles. My father and this one are finding it even harder to contain ourselves. But our most important plans are being deployed lately, so even if we find it difficult, we must contain ourselves. I take this opportunity to ask, when you said that this prince must pay attention on my visit to the palace, what was this prince meant to pay attention to? Yu Yu takes a sip of wine. Father received some information day before last. Looks like Prince Jia managed to take control over some number of troops a few divisions in the north are probably in his hands now. I wonder if your highness was able to learn something from his attitude during this last banquet of the six princes. It's little wonder that Prince Jia's spine seemed more steely during our last meeting at the palace then. 
Prince Jio wants to be that old goose, to spread his wings and laugh at the snow with disdain. He's been hibernating for so long that one must wonder if he will feel a bit rusty holding onto those troops. Yun Yu sets down his empty cup and looks up at me. The current state of affairs must be carefully planned. Each warp and weft must be tight, discreet, and perfectly executed. We must calculate each of our steps carefully. There is a touch of fatigue to his features. If there was no conspiracy, no scheming, and all that sits between heaven and earth was as bright and expansive as this water pavilion, how tranquil and contented we would be drinking across a table like this, leisurely appreciating this lake. Too bad the world cannot be molded to our desires, if there's no conspiracy and no scheming, why ever would Yun Yu approach me? And to drink across from one another for a lake viewing while enjoying the cool air that would be even more improbable. I glance over at Yun Yu, and finally tell him something that I've always held back in my heart. There's something I've been meaning to convince you to do, but I never told you because I knew you wouldn't accept it. But now that the situation has gotten this tense, I feel that it may be a pivotal move, and so I think I should tell you anyway. Yun Yu stares at me, cup in hand. Suiya, you should withdraw from this rebellion. Don't be a part of it. End chapter. Imperial Uncle. Chapter 28. Yun Yu had the cup against his lips just about to drink, but as soon as he hears my words his expression swiftly changes and he looks as though he's joking. Your Highness, why are you, why are you saying something like that all of a sudden? I meet his gaze. It's really hard to say whether our plan will succeed. Wang Qin, your father and this prince have already exhausted every last resource we had saved. We should keep one last go piece in the shadows better to plan for another day. Yun Yu stares at me without a word. I continue, there is a valley somewhere in the southwest. Even though it's not as affluent and peaceful as Jiangnan, it's picturesque enough and has all that one may need. It's about a fortnight's journey from the capital. I tell Yun Yu that when he leaves my estate today, he will meet an assassination attempt on his way home. Once rescued from the jaws of death, he will need some time to convalesce in a villa the Yun family owns in Jiangnan. Once in Suzhou, he will stay a night there before continuing on the next day. Yun Yu won't look at me anymore. He stares at the cup in his hands, and says nothing aside from you've thought of everything, your highness. This prince have been deliberating over this course of action for a long time, and find you the only suitable candidate. Scholarship, strategy, and courage are all traits you possess. Rarer still, you happen to be quite young you have years ahead of you. I mean these words from the bottom of my heart. If Yun Tang and Wang Qin are executed, they deserve everything they get. But I have always felt some tenderness towards Yun Yu perhaps even guilt. Yun Yu is a prize. Kitch he needs a magnanimous and benevolent chancellor like Lu Tongyi among his court, but he also needs outstandingly talented officials such as Yun Yu. Other than doing as his father asked and often coming to me to discuss arrangements of treason, Yun Yu has never done anything unworthy of the government. Yun Yu sets down his wine cup again. Did your highness speak those words in jest, or did you really mean that? He laughs, and rising, he paces to the railing. The arrow is already knocked. His Majesty may have been watching us closely for a long time already. Your Highness is still talking about putting a hidden go piece in the opening game now. It's too late. It's not too late. If I'm telling you this, it's because it can be done. That valley was actually a safe escape I'd been keeping for myself. At any rate, I do walk around with a title like biggest cancer of this dynasty, I have sufficient resources to send Yun Yu over there and have plenty left to spare. If the plan succeeds and this prince sees the throne, this prince will summon you back to the capital immediately. And if by chance this whole business fails, you will stay there. If you want to take revenge, then take revenge, if you want to hide your identity and live on, then live on. Then at least one person from our side will survive. By the time Yun Tang and Wang Qin are executed, it would be best if Yun Yu could turn his thinking around, 
and for that emperor cousin of mine not to hold the past against him either and make him go back to court to work as an official once more. But I also know such an ending is highly improbable. Whether Yun Yu chooses to stay out of this affair and fade into obscurity, or wants to come back to take his revenge on me and seriously stab me to death, I'd feel better either way. Things wouldn't stand the way they are now it feels burdensome every time I see him. By the railing, Yun Yu turns back to me, and suddenly sinks to his knees. Surprised, I immediately get up to try to help him up, but Yun Yu just kneels there as though he's been nailed to the floor, and try as I may I can't budge him. So it's not a jest then, your highness. You don't have to be so tactful about it. Deep inside this servant know full well that you don't have complete trust in my father and this one. Since this servant have made up his mind to follow you, this servant is prepared to die at any given time that is this one's intention. But if you're really not reassured of my father's loyalty and would like to take this servant as a hostage, this servant will comply with those wishes as well. However, Yun Yu looks up at me, his gaze and his expression quite calm, if you send this servant to the southwest now, it will surely rouse the suspicions of the loyalist faction. A drug would be much more dependable. You probably have slow-acting or mind-controlling drugs right here in your estate, this servant have a few bottles at home as well. I had been leaning over, trying to help Yun you up, but after hearing this speech I nearly end up on the floor myself. A thought keeps running through my mind, he may as well just take a knife and stab me and end it all, but in the end all I'm able to say is, just pretend I, never said anything. What I actually wanted to say is, ah, so in your eyes, that's the kind of person I am. Or rather, how could I ever be suspicious of you like that? But I have no confidence to say any of that. I've been scheming for Yun Yu's life in the first place. What right do I have to say anything of the sort? I can do nothing but sigh. Just pretend I never said anything. Get up first, all right. My tone is so diplomatic, it practically sounds like I'm begging him. Yun Yu remains kneeling, forcing me to add, Chief Yun, if this prince really were suspicious of you, why then have this one always, with you? Yun Yu laughs bitterly once more. This servant has already been reflecting. Have this servant been too ignorant of the hierarchy and acted too frivolously in front of you all along? This servant came onto you and nearly crossed the line that day at the Moonlight Pavilion to have been so shameless, how will your highness ever judge the savant's actions? In trying to help you you up, I already ended up sitting on the floor. I don't know how to say this, and after struggling to find words over and over I only managed to say, Suiya, even if you're trying to find words to upset me, you shouldn't put yourself down so. Yun Yu finally looks up at me. And again I try to reason with him. Just pretend I never said anything. Get up, all right. Still Yun Yu does not move. I'm finally forced to tell him something earnest and true with all my heart. At the Moonlight Pavilion, I know that you only did what you did because you had something on your mind, and drank too much. This prince. I. I'm afraid that I took it seriously. Both my hands were gripping Yun Yu's sleeve at first, but now that I've let him go, I'm surprised to find them coated in sweat. Suiya, to tell the truth, you're the only person who's ever been this close to me, who doesn't stand on ceremony with me. Whether it was Princess Consort Hawaii or anyone I've ever taken a fancy to even choose soon no one has ever had room for this one in their heart. As for Chancellor Lu, that would be even less likely. The truth is, that's all I've ever wanted, to have someone really keep me in their heart, and for me to keep them in mine. We'll talk, drink tea, chat with each other every day, and never tire of it till death. That's enough. But if that person turns out to be Yun Yu, then the whole thing falls apart. There are some things that I've already realized since that day at the Moonlight Pavilion, but it cannot be. Even if it exists, I cannot admit it does. But talking about something like that right now can only do harm, and confers no benefit. Suiya, you, you know that this prince has a cut sleeve. 
If I fell for you, Suiya, it would be troublesome. Yu Yu stares at me for a while, then he raises a brow. That's true. It really would be troublesome. The one your highness loves is Chancellor Lu, so however could you fall for the servant? Your highness's feelings would surely never change. While he's saying this, he finally gets up. I let out a breath at long last, and I get up as well. Suiya. Yun Yu heaves a sigh, don't worry, your highness. What happened at the Moonlight Pavilion will never happen again. Whatever is in my heart, I will keep in my heart. This servant won't say it. Suiya. Yun Yu stares at me, and suddenly breaks into a smile. This servant was just joking. Last time, this servant really did have something on my mind. This servant drank too much. If this servant really did want to do something, and your highness seizes the throne, then this servant would become an official who social climbs in the emperor's chambers. That's not a reputation this servant can bear no matter how shameless the servant may be, so this servant would rather do without. He gives me another smile. Let's end this conversation on that note. Your highness and this servant will just both pretend some things never happened. This servant would like to go now. I look on as he bows to me, and together we leave the water pavilion, reaching the shore through the floating corridor. The whole way back, Yun Yu never speaks again, and I find myself unable to say anything at all. Once we reach the other side, Yun Yu leaves immediately without staying another moment. After he goes, I return to my room to sit down. Hours later, I'm still not back to myself. I really don't know what to do with Yun Yu anymore. He took a knife and jabbed at my heart for half a day, each time more fiercely than the last. He must have known. He knows that I actually love him. Lu Tongyi is a dream, of ripples and moonlight's reflection on water, pervasive with sweet Osman thus. It was precisely what he said to me in the water pavilion that woke me from that dream, that made me understand the advantage of reality. Even though I don't want to mull over what happened at the moonlight pavilion, I have no choice but to mull over it. Connecting the incident with all that happened before, I realized that there's no reason for Yun Yu to do what he did, unless... Unless he's fallen for me. It's a rather bold notion. I shouldn't let my imagination run wild like a young man's at my age, but I cannot help that the idea comes to me. And the more I check this idea against Yun Yu's recent conduct, the more certain it seems. I don't know why, but once this idea is conceived, an ineffable joy actually arises in my heart. But after joy, what's left is grief. The rebellion is imminent. What will become of me after this? What will become of Yun Yu after this? Whatever the outcome may be, it can't be anything good. I conspire against Yun Yu, it really is a grave injustice. Maybe this is just karmic retribution. But why should Yun Yu have to share in this karmic retribution? That's why I have no intention of accepting it. While I suffer in the bedroom, the palace dispatches another messenger to tell me that my emperor nephew has business with me. As an emperor's command is as important as the natural order, I have no choice but to change into formal court dress and hurry my way to the palace. Emperor Nephew has a knot between his brows and layer upon layers of worries written over his face. He studies me, and asks, Imperial Uncle, why do you look so depressed? Seems there is something on your mind. I waste no time in telling him that it's nothing, just that Han Si doesn't know any better and refuses to marry the queen. I'm trying to talk him around to the idea. Oh, Han Si, is it? We had a feeling that he may not happily go be a king consort. If you can't convince him well, it doesn't matter. Yun Yu goes to your estate often, so why don't you let him persuade Han Si? My heart skips a beat, and I hasten to add, this servant is afraid that Chief Yun isn't so good at this either. Kijhi raises a hand. Never mind. We can't be bothered to deal with that whole king consort business today. If Yun Yu's no good at persuasion, then we will send someone most proficient at persuasion to your estate instead. That would be Chancellor Lu. 
and he really does just call for a eunuch and passes on an order, getting Lu Tongyi to go to my estate for a chat with Hansi. I look on helplessly as the court eunuch accepts the order and leaves, I have no idea what my emperor nephew could be plotting. Kichi wins his way back to the throne, and calls for a chair to be moved to my side. He grins toothily at me. Right then, Chancellor Lu is going to your estate to chat with Han Si, so how about you stay and chat with us, Imperial Uncle? It's nothing important really, we just have a lot on my mind and want to talk to someone. His grin grows even wider. Imperial Uncle, please have a seat. I thank Kichi for his favor, and feeling as though a stone's hanging from my heart, I take my seat, and Kichi begins to speak. All this time, we have been very hesitant about this one person. We don't know what we should do with him. Whether we should get rid of him or if we should just let him be. End chapter.